So in unit three, we're going to be talking about intermolecular forces first. These are some of the things that you're expected to know if you want to pause the video and read through those. And then here's the rest of them. London dispersion forces occur in all covalent compounds, except network covalent. Some network covalent will have them, but mostly it's covalent bonds. But it's the only force in nonpolar molecules. It occurs because of the random motion of electrons on atoms within molecules. At a given moment, a nonpolar molecule might have more electrons on one side than the other side, giving it an instantaneous dipole. Here we have atom A and atom B, no polarization occurring, but if more electrons go to the left side than the right side, we get a slightly negative, slightly positive, which then will induce a dipole on atom B. So here we have slightly positive, so the electrons in the next atom will be attracted to that side, making it slightly negative, slightly positive, which then is a domino effect for all the atoms around it. The more electrons a nonpolar molecule or any molecule has, the greater the chance of it having one of these instantaneous dipoles, which we say is more polarizable. Dipole-dipole forces occur in polar molecules. Dipole-polar, so polar-polar forces. The positive end of one molecule is going to be attracted to the negative end of another molecule. But positive positive will have repulsion and negative negative has repulsion. So that's why they can't get super close together because we still have that attraction repulsion happening. The more polar the molecule, the stronger the dipole dipole force. Hydrogen bonds are a type of dipole dipole force that is much stronger than a regular dipole dipole, so it gets its own name. These are not bonds. Make sure that you are very clear that you're breaking hydrogen bonds, which are attractions. Here we can see ethanol interacting with a water and a water. Notice that the oxygen is attracted to the slightly positive hydrogen of oxygen, and hydrogen is attracted to the oxygen of ethanol. It occurs when hydrogen is attached to an NO or F, and it's attracted to an NO or F. So here are our intermolecular forces. We didn't talk about all of them a second ago, but we have ion dipole, which is between a polar and a nonpolar. This is how salts will dissolve, or any ionic compound dissolves in water. We have hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole. Dipole-induced dipole is between a nonpolar and polar. And then Linden dispersion forces are the only force found in nonpolar, but again, they're going to exist in all of these. These rank from highest to lowest, but that is relative high to low. The main thing we're going to look at is the properties of substances to determine the strength of IMF. And we'll see that more in a little bit. So for ionic bonding, the higher the charge and the smaller the size, the stronger an ionic bond. For ion dipole, you have to have two different molecules. One's ionic and one's polar. For London dispersion, the more electrons you have, the stronger the force will be. Dipole induced, again, it's two different molecules, a polar and a nonpolar. And for dipole dipole, which is also hydrogen bonding, we want smaller size and more electronegative. So go ahead and pause the video and figure out where hydrogen bonding would occur. Remember that hydrogen bonding is not between nitrogen and hydrogen within the same molecule. That is a covalent bond. You also can't have a nitrogen attracted to the hydrogen over here because this hydrogen is attached to a carbon. So it's got to be a nitrogen of one molecule attracted to the hydrogen of another molecule. Or this nitrogen is attracted to that hydrogen. So that would be two examples. Go ahead and figure out what type of intermolecular force is represented below. Restart when you're done. So this one's polar, and this one's also polar. They're two different molecules. 
This one, methanol, has a oxygen that's attached to a hydrogen, so this one can hydrogen bond, it can dipole-dipole in London dispersion. But this one is just polar, it cannot hydrogen bond. So although we have a hydrogen atta attracted to an O, it's attached to a carbon. So this would be dipole-dipole. There's also probably some linen dispersion forces happening as well, but the main force is going to be dipole-dipole. I'm going to pause the video and do this one, restart when you're done. So water's polar, xenon is nonpolar. So between a polar and a nonpolar, we would have dipole-induced dipole. So xenon shouldn't be polar, but oxygen is slightly negative, and as it approaches xenon, it distorts the electron cloud, making it slightly polar, or inducing it to be polar. So we get an instantaneous dipole. And last one, I'm going to pause the video and figure out what IMF is represented here. So our IMFs are those dotted lines. We have hydrogen that's attached to an N and attracted to an O, so that would be a hydrogen bond. This one also, we have an H that's attached to an N and attracted to an N, so that's also a hydrogen bond, so this would be a hydrogen bond. Again, you also have some dipole-dipole and LDF occurring, but the strongest force would be a hydrogen bond. So here we have iodine solid. What would iodine liquid look like? And then what would iodine gas look like? I'm going to pause the video and figure that out. You can show the intermolecular forces with little dashed lines like we saw in the previous pictures. So this would be iodine liquid. There are still some attractions because it's a liquid. Without attractions, it would become a solid. So we just have some space between the molecules. Iodine gas is also going to be diatomic because we're not breaking any bonds when it turns into a gas. We're just breaking these attractions. So we're no longer going to have attractions in the gas form. It's just going to be spread out and filling that container. And again, it's together because iodine is I2. Go ahead and draw three molecules of NH3 in the box above, showing intermolecular forces with a dashed line again. So here we have three ammonias, and they should, they should have attractions between the hydrogens and the nitrogens. We're not going to have attraction between the hydrogens or between the nitrogens. So if we were to draw an aqueous solution of NH3, if we were to draw it first, the nitrogen should stay together with the hydrogen. And then if we were to include water in there, which way would the oxygen face? Towards the hydrogens or towards the nitrogens? Well, the oxygens should face towards the hydrogen because they're going to have attractions there. And then the hydrogens should face towards the nitrogen. Ionic substances as a solid look like this, where we have our negative ions and our positive ions repeating. Ionic so substances that dissolve in water do so because the attraction of the ions to the dipoles of the water molecules. So that's going to look like this. Notice that we have our positive sodium, and it's attracted to the negative or slightly negative oxygen. And then bromine is attracted to the slightly positive hydrogens. The water surrounds the ions, keeping the ions from going back together. 
So this type of IMF is what we refer to as ion dipole. We have an ion, and then we have a dipole, which is water. So here are, so here's some information about the properties of solids. Again, you may want to pause it and read through those. And then here's some more. So some types of solids that you need to know about are network covalent solids. So network covalent solids are going to be carbon, whether it be diamond, graphite, fluorines, or buckyballs, silicon dioxide, silicon carbide. In a network covalent, atoms are held together in a lattice of covalent bonds. Network covalent solids solids are very hard and have a very very high melting and boiling point due to them breaking covalent bonds during boiling. It's the only type that you're going to break a covalent bond. All others you're breaking forces. The electrons are localized in a covalent bond so they are not free to move around making them poor conductors of electricity. So here's our types of solids. We have metallic solids which are where it's just a metal. We have noble gases or group 8A. Group 8A doesn't have any bonding within it because it's just an atom, but they have London dispersion forces between them. So they're going to be very weak. So low melting points and don't conduct. Then we have network covalent solids, which have covalent bonds within it and covalent bonds between them. So because you're breaking a bond, it's going to have very high melting points and they're not conductive or malleable. Ionic bonds have ionic bonding within and ionic bonds between. So again, we have high melting points anytime we're breaking bonds. And finally, molecular solids have covalent bonds within and then forces London dispersion and then either dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding, or just London between them, giving them low melting points. So go ahead and pause the video and figure out what type of solid is in each of these. So again, your choices are metallic, group 8A, network covalent, ionic, and molecular. So the first one is just a metal, so that's metallic. The next one starts with a non-metal, so that's molecular. Next one, we have a metal and a non-metal, so that's ionic. Bronze is a type of alloy, and alloys are metallic because it's a mixture of metals. And diamond is a network covalent. So the stronger the intermolecular force is, the higher the boiling point, the higher the capillary action, higher surface tension, higher heat of vaporization. Generally higher viscosity, but that also has to do with how complex the molecule is. The lower the vapor pressure, the lower the volatility. Volatility is how easily it turns into a gas. And if it turns into a gas easily, then it would have a high vapor pressure. So the lower the volatility or the harder it is for it to turn into a gas, the less pressure we have due to it turning into a vapor. The higher the freezing point and higher the melting point. So the higher the IMF, higher pretty much all your properties except vapor pressure and volatility. So based on data, and again, if you're given data such as vapor pressure, boiling point, heat of vaporization, you're going to use that to determine which is the weakest IMF. You can't say London dispersion is always the weakest because it depends on how many electrons. There's lots of overlap. So go to pause the video and figure this one out. Restart when you're done. So if we want weakest IMF, we want the highest vapor pressure. And the highest vapor pressure is 92 or methanol. So this one actually has the weakest IMF.
go ahead and look at this data and figure out which statement best explains the reason that nonane has a higher boiling point than 2,3-trifluoropentane. So this one has the higher boiling point. Well, A is saying that it's easier to break bonds than other bonds. We don't break bonds. The CF bond is more polar than the CH bond. Well, it is, but that would exp not explain why this has a higher boiling point. If anything, that would explain why this one should have the higher boiling point. The carbon chains are longer in no nonane than they are in that one. Okay, and then the carbon chains are further apart in no name. Well, if they're further apart, then that would mean it would have a lower boiling point. So C, if I have a longer carbon chain, I'm going to have more electrons, greater chance that they have one of those momentary dipoles or is polarizability. Given these properties, figure out what type of compound or element each of these unknowns are. So Z is conductive, and if it's conductive, then that means it must be metallic because these were all solids at 25 degrees Celsius. So it's the only one that conducts as a solid. It also is insoluble in water. The one that's a liquid at room temp has the lowest melting point, so a low melting point corresponds to a molecular solid, generally. And so knowing that, we know that Z is metallic. Y would not have been ionic, but it is molecular. So D is our best answer. So here it says we have bromine and iodine. Why is the boiling points 59 and 184 degrees Celsius respectively? Restart when you're done. Well, neither of them are network covalent, so that one's wrong. B is talking about bonds breaking. Again, we don't break bonds unless it's network covalent. D says bromine has a greater electronegativity. So that wouldn't be the reason because they don't have dipole-dipole forces. They're both LDF. Iodine has more electrons, so it's more polarizable than those of bromine. So greater London forces. That would be correct. I'm going to pause the video and try this one. Restart when you're done. This one's ionic, and if it's ionic, as a solid, it should be a non-conductor, and it has high melting points, not low melting points, so D. Go ahead and solve this one. For condensation to occur at the lowest pressure, we want the highest IMF, because the molecules will have attractions, so they don't need as high of a pressure to cause those attractions. They're going to already want to go together. These are all LDF because they're all nonpolar. They all have just C and H. So the most electrons would have the highest LDF. And since butane has the highest molar mass, it also has the most electrons. So butane is our correct answer. Go ahead and pause this one and figure out why is xenon have the highest boiling point? Well, they're all noble gases and they're all nonpolar. They're all group 8A, so A can't be right. The atomic mass shouldn't have anything to do with it, nor does its velocity. But xenon does have more electrons, and if it has more electrons, it's going to be more polarizable. And D is just making a statement. It's not explaining why its boiling point is the greatest. It's true in this case, but not a reason why. 
You go ahead and pause that and read through those statements. So the phase of a substance is directly related to the strength of its intermolecular forces. Solids are highly ordered and their particles are packed together while gases are going to be spread out and they don't have attractions between them. And most of the volume is empty space. Thus, the strength of intermolecular forces plays a role in the phase behavior of the substance. In other words, substances that exhibit just weak attractions tend to be gases at room temp, and those that have stronger attractions are going to be solids at room temp. For the ideal gas law, you need to be able to use PIVNERT. PV equals an RT. Remember that equation is on the chart. You also need to know Dalton's law, which is P total equals P1 plus P2 plus P3, or the variation of that, which is partial pressure of gas A is equal to the total pressure times moles of that gas. It doesn't say it on there, but you also need to know the combined gas law. So PV over T equals PV over T. Your pressures and volumes don't matter what unit they're in as long as they're the same, but temperature has to be in Kelvin. For the ideal gas law, we have the R, which is on your formula chart. This R, though, is only for energy. So we're going to use that with our delta G calculations but and with our E cell calculations, but we won't be using it with gas laws. So for gas laws, we can use this one or this one, whether we have ATM or TOR. Your pressure conversions are on the formula chart. They tell you what STP is, and remember that one mole equals 22.4 liters if you're at STP and if it's a gas. With that, if you need a solve for molar mass, moles is equal to grams per molar mass. And then we could rearrange that for molar mass is equal to dirt over P. Density times R times T over P. So that density is in grams per liter. You should also be familiar with these relationships. If volume is constant, and pressure increases, then temperature will increase. So increased pressure equals increased temperature. Or if temperature is constant and you increase the pressure, then your volume will decrease. And if temperature increases, then volume is also going to increase. You should also be familiar graphically what that means. So here we have temperature and so here we have pressure and volume. Notice it's an inverse relationship. As per volume goes up, pressure is going down. While if we did 1 over P times V, then it's a direct relationship because that's the inverse of pressure. Volume and temperature is a direct relationship, and pressure and temperature is a direct relationship. We've already talked about Dalton's Law. You should note that the partial pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles of that gas present, and therefore the number of molecules of the gas present in the mixture. So if 25% of the gas in the mixture is helium, then the partial pressure is 25% of the total. And that's what we have in this equation. So go ahead and pause the video and try finding your total pressure of the tank when those two gases are combined. So here is a picture of what's happening. We have nitrogen, which is in a 2 liter container with a 1 ATM pressure, and then argon in a 1 liter container with a 1 ATM pressure. And then we're going to transfer those to a 1 liter container. So my argon is going to be 1 ATM because the volume hasn't changed. But nitrogen, its volume went down, so its pressure is going to double. So it's going to be 2 atm due to nitrogen, because that's 2 liters times 1 atm, but it's going in a 1 liter container. What's its new pressure? New pressure is 2 divided by 1, or 2 atm. 
So to get the total pressure of the tank, I just add those up and I get 3 ATM. I'm going to pause the video and try this one. So 10% is allowed to skate, but it is a rigid metal tank. So the volume of the gas won't decrease because the volume will expand to fill the container again. The pressure of the gas will decrease though because there's going to be less collisions now. We haven't changed the temperature, so the kinetic energy remains the same. And the gas remaining can't be the same because we've lost some gas. So it should be less mass than it started. So that's B. And go ahead and solve this last one. Restart when you're done. So notice these are all one liter containers and we're going to a two liter container. This one has four atoms and it has a pressure of two ATM. This one only has two atoms, so if I have twice or half the number of atoms, I should have half the ATM. So this one should be one ATM. And this one, if you count them all up, you get 12 particles. Well, that's three times as many particles as over here, so two times three is six ATM. So if I added all those up, I get two plus one plus six, that's going to give me 9 ATM. Those 9 ATM are in a 1 liter container, but they're about to be in a 2 liter container. So 9 is equal to 2x. So the new pressure is going to be 4.5 ATM. So kinetic molecular theory, you can pause this and read through it, but you basically need to know how to read up Max Boltzmann distribution in terms of particles as well as temperature. And the Kelvin temperature of a sample is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the particles in the sample. So same temperature, same kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy of an ideal gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature. The greater the temperature, the greater the average kinetic energy. Gas particles are in constant motion, colliding with one another and the walls of the container. Pressure is caused by the number and force of collisions of gas particles with the walls of the container. I'm going to answer these five questions. Restart when you're done. The first thing that I do is write out pivnert and say, what is the same? Well, they're equal volume, they're at the same temperature, and the same pressure. So, since R is a constant, I know the moles must be the same. So A wants to know, will the molecules of A be equal to the molecules of B? So this one's true. Because we had equal moles, we must have equal molecules, because one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to 23rd molecules. Well then, if I know that I have equal moles, is the molar mass of A greater than that of B? No, because I have equal moles, the substance with the greatest mass must have the greatest molar mass. So B has 0.48 grams per mole, while substance A is only 0.34 grams per mole. Do they have the same kinetic energy? Yes. Because they're at the same temperature, and temperature is directly related to the average kinetic energy. Does molecule A have the same average velocity as the molecules of B? No. Because they have different molar masses, gas A, which has a smaller molar mass, will have a greater average velocity than gas B. And do the molecules of A collide with the walls of the container more frequently than molecules of B? No, since they have the same pressure, they're going to have equal collisions with the walls of the container. 
go ahead and pause the video and figure out which color corresponds to each of these noble gases. Well, this dark blue one is the one that has the greatest speed on average, which would be the lightest one, or helium. Xenon would have the biggest molar mass and therefore the lowest range in velocities. And then argon and neon. It could have also asked about temperature. And this one would have been the, this one down here would have been the highest temperature or the smallest molar mass like it was in this question. So deviations from ideal gas laws, you need to realize that and what it causes. So go ahead and take a second and read through this slide. Uh, restart when you're done reading through the slide. So gases are most ideal under summer conditions which are low pressures and high temperatures. If the conditions are the same, then you have to look at the gas itself, and the most ideal is the one that has the lowest intermolecular forces because it wouldn't form attractions as easily, and the smaller particle size because then the volume of the gas particles is more closely to being zero. So on this question, it wants to know why is the pressure of SO2 less than all the other ones? Well, it doesn't have a larger average speed. If anything, helium would have a greater average speed. Occupy a larger portion of the container volume than the other gases. All gases fill the container. Stronger intermolecular forces would cause it to have a lower pressure because there'd be less collisions as some of the molecules have attracted and made basically one molecule versus two that are hitting. And the double bonds doesn't have anything to do with number of collisions. So it doesn't have anything to do with pressure. So the answer was C. I'm gonna pause the video and answer this one. So where we want low pressure and high temperature. So the highest temperature is either B or D, and then lowest pressure is B, so B is our answer. So you need to know your molarity equation. It's on the formula chart, but molarity is moles per liter, and that's how we measure concentration. You sometimes see mole fraction, like we saw it with the gas law equation a few minutes ago. And you should also know how to dilute a solution. So M1V1 equals M2V2. So which of the following is the most concentrated solution and how can you tell? I'm going to pause the video and try this one and restart when you're done. So we want the most moles per liter for it to be the most concentrated. This one, we've got four particles or four moles for every one liter. So that would be a four molarity. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six. Six divided by four is 1.5 molarity. Four divided by two is a two molarity. And one, two, three, four, five, six. Six divided by two is a three molarity. So solution A is the most concentrated. going to draw a representation of two molar solution of aluminum sulfate. Leave off water for simplicity's sake. And one formula unit for each mole. Going to use the key of a filled in circle for aluminum ion and a open box for sulfate ion. So when drawing it for a one liter container, we had two molarity is equal to one liter X. We needed two moles. For every two moles, there should be four aluminum. 
and it should be broken apart because it's ions in solution and it's soluble. So then our sulfate, we need two times three or six sulfates. While for a half a liter, that means we need one mole. And if I need one mole, I just need two aluminums and three sulfates. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one. Restart when you're done. So we want the smaller size and the greatest charge. And all of these, they have the same charge, so we want the smallest size. So zinc would have the strongest attraction, and then calcium, and then barium. So A, smaller ions have greater attractions. So you also need to be able to separate mixtures. You can pause the video to read through these. So there's many ways to separate a mixture. Three ways are distillation, filtration, and chromatography. Distillation separates solutions with different boiling points. So we can use intermolecular forces and the knowledge of that to separate them based on boiling. Filtration will separate a solid from a liquid mixture. And chromatography will separate mixtures also by their polarities. So we have two different types of filtering systems shown here. One, we have a suspension of a solid and a liquid. We pour it through, the solid gets stuck in the funnel, and whatever dissolves in the solution is our filtrate. Then we can dry the filter paper and determine how much solid we recovered. If we have two liquids, technically we can use a separatory funnels to separate two liquids that are immensible, meaning they don't mix with each other. Distillation is used to separate liquids of different boiling points, like we'd mentioned. So we heat up this liquid. The first substance that boils off is going to go up, go down, and condense into this flask over here. Once the temperature starts going up again, we know that that first substance has all been boiled off. So we would remove this flask and replace it with a new flask, collecting each of the samples as the boiling point was constant. Because remember, the boiling point will stay constant until all of that substance is boiled away. And then chromatography. We have paper chromatography shown in this right-hand side. We have water or whatever the solvent is. It could be alcohol, it could be water. And we have our ink spot or whatever our substance is to be separated. As the water or solvent goes up, that is the mobile phase. And then the stationary phase is which ones are attracted to the paper. So the substance that travels the furthest with the solvent is the most similar to the solvent. And so over here, water's polar, so this blue one would be the most polar. The yellow would be the least polar. When using paper chromatography, you do have to make sure that the water level is the same in each experiment, and that's what we refer to as the RF value, which is basically the difference from where it started to the water level. So using this chromatography picture, which two are most similar structures? Well, these two traveled roughly the same distance, so that would be the answer. I'm going to pause it and do this one. We want the one most similar to the solvent, which is the one that traveled the furthest. So that would be B. And then pause it and solve this last one. So O is more strongly onto the stationary phase. So remember, the mobile fa phase is the one that is traveling. But since it stayed back, it's more strongly attracted to the stationary phase. 
and therefore has a smaller RF value because it traveled the least distance. So substances with similar intermolecular attractions tend to be minciple or soluble in one another because like dissolves like. Remember that you can't just say like dissolves like, you do need to be specific on what forces are happening between the solute and solvent. So we're going to pause the video and solve this one. Restart when you're done. So we want the one that has a least amount of solute-solvent interaction in an aqueous solution, so with water. Well, ionic is going to interact with water, as well as polar, but nonpolar will have the least interactions with a polar substance. So which of these is least soluble in water? Well, they're all polar, and they all can form hydrogen bonds, but D has a really long nonpolar section, and then this tail, which is polar. That's going to cause it to not be as soluble as something like A, where more of these methanol molecules can get with the water and get closer together. So go ahead and pause the video and figure this one out. Make sure that you're discussing both substances in your answer and which intermolecular forces they have with water. So for mine, I said that pyridine is polar, benzene is nonpolar, and water is polar. So just stating what type of polarity each of the solutes and the solvent have. Pyridine can form hydrogen bonds and dipole, dipole attractions with water, which are stronger than the weaker dipole-induced dipole and London forces that benzene can form. Therefore, benzene will not be soluble while pyridine will be. So the main thing that you needed is to say what the polarity of each thing was and that the interactions with pyridine and water are going to be stronger because it's polar. It can form those dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonds, which are stronger than what benzene can form. So with spectroscopy, occasionally it pops up and you need to know the differences in absorption or emission of photons in different spectral regions. Microwave radiation is associated with rotational levels. It's not uh, correct, but you can think microwaves rotate food around, so it's rotational energy. Infrared can only do vibrational because infrared is below even red on the electromagnetic spectrum, so that's not a whole lot of energy, so it can only cause vibrations. While UV and visible radiation is more energy, and so that can actually cause electronic energy transition. So I'm going to pause the video and figure this one out. So microwave is rotational, infrared, vibrational. Yes, while the other ones have microwaves for electronic energy or infrared for rotational. And so all the others are incorrect. So the answer is A. Remember that you're given these two equations on your formula chart. And when a photon is absorbed or emitted by an atom or molecule, the energy of the species is increased or decreased by an amount equal to the energy of that photon. So wavelength times frequency is equal to speed of light. And your speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Many times wavelengths in nanometers... which is one times 10 to the negative, one times 10 to the ninth nanometers is one meter. So a line spectrum indicates the energies that are allowed for a particular element. It occurs because the energy is quantized and so the energy goes from one step to another. So each element has particular wavelengths that it can absorb and release at. 
So that's a different fingerprint basically for each element, which helps us identify those elements. How these fingerprints are formed is electricity is passed through the sample, which excite the electrons. As they come back down, they release energy in these different quantas. So that's what this first one is saying, explain in terms of electrons and energy, how a spectrum is produced. So go ahead and identify all elements in the mixture and how many valence electrons a cadmium atom has. So IDing the mixture, you just needed to say, well, my mixture's here. Those are the same line, same line, same line. But where did this line come from? Up here, lithium. So notice that we have lithium and we have strontium. Any line that was in lithium and strontium is in our mixture, but we don't have cadmium in our mixture. So for valence electrons of cadmium, it has two. Cadmium has electrons 5s2 and then 4d10, but those are its valence electrons because those are its outermost electrons. This equation is on your formula chart, but you can use the combined equation if you remember it, or you can combine this equation with the one that we learned a second ago, which is that one. Planck's constant is on the formula chart, and it shows the relationship between energy that is absorbed or released. So as it goes to a higher energy state, it absorbs, and as it comes back down, it releases energy. So go ahead and try this past AP question. Restart when you're done. So for this first one, we were writing the electron configuration for potassium. It didn't say that we had to write it longhand. We could have done it shorthand as well. So this is the electron configuration for potassium atom, but this has a charge. So it's gonna lose one electron, just be the electronic configuration there. We could have also had neon, 3s2, 3p6. So for B, we have potassium's valence electron is in the fourth energy level, while sodium's valence electron is in the third energy level. Since potassium's valence electron is further from the nucleus, it'll have a weaker attraction requiring less energy to remove an electron. For this next one, we had to convert our wavelength to energy. So you could have used both equations or you could have said, let me just use the combined one. So here, all of our units cancel out, except joules, and so we get 4.7 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. You didn't have to solve it that way. You also could have solved it using two equations, solving for frequency first and getting that, and then converting your frequency to energy. We get the same answer regardless. So then it says, is the energy of one photon of violet light sufficient to cause ionization? So there's two ways of doing it. I started with my answer from I, and that was joules per photon, and converted that to joules per mole. There's an Avogadro's number of photons in a mole. And that gives me 2.8 times 10 to the fifth joules per mole. So that's how much energy is in violet light. 
that is smaller than potassium. So no, violet light does not have sufficient energy to ionize potassium. It only has this much energy and we need 4.19 times 10 to the fifth. The answer key for this test had, um, they converted the potassium, which is 4.19 joules per mole to joules per photon. And then compared that with our answer that we had gotten previously and said no, because potassium has more energy than what violet light had. So either way, you could have done it. So Beer-Lambert Law is A equals EBC. So the E describes how intense a sample of molecules or ions absorb light at a specific wavelength. B is path length and C is concentration. And concentration is proportional to the number of absorbing species. So in most experiments, the path length and wavelength of light are held constant. And in such cases, absorbance is proportional only to the concentration of absorbing molecules or ions. So again, we have that same information here. So go ahead and pause the video and try these last problems on your own. Restart when you're done. So the first thing you need to do for this one is we're diluting. So we have 0.1 solution. We don't know how much of it we need, but we're trying to make a 0.02 molar and we're gonna make 100 milliliters of it because we have a 100 milliliter volumetric flask. So solving that out, we get 20 milliliters. So step one is I'm gonna measure 20 milliliters of a 0.1 molar cobalt two chloride solution using a burette into a 100 milliliter volumetric flask. Then add distilled water to the 100 milliliter volumetric flask until the solution reaches the 100 milliliter calibration mark. Technically then you would cover it and mix. You also could have done it this way. So instead of using the burette, they said pipette 20 mils of the 0.1 cobalt 2 chloride into the 100 milliliter volumetric flask, then add enough water to reach the 100 milliliter mark on the neck of the volumetric flask. Stopper the flask and mix. Notice you got one point for calculating 20 mils and then one point for adding enough volume to reach 100 mils or the rest of the steps. So B says identify the optimal wavelength for the analysis. Well, we can go with percent transmission or absorbance. Most of the time it's absorbance, but either way, we want the lowest transmission or the greatest absorbance. That comes out to about 510 nanometers. On the actual test, anything from 490 to 520 was accepted. Notice it doesn't say explain, so I don't have to justify how I got that answer. So go ahead and solve these three. Restart when you're done. So for that first one, all I need to do is say 0.275 is about here, follow that over. So that's about 0 0.050 molarity. Then D just wants to know what are the three factors that determine the amount of light that passes through the solution. Identify two of them. So really that's just asking about Beer's Law. So A, B, or C, but you couldn't have just put the symbols. You did have to say what they stood for. So path length and concentration would probably be the two easiest. And again, path, path length of the test tube or cuvette, whatever we're using. Then we have some error analysis. It says the student handles the sample and leaves fingerprints on it. 
How would that have affected the calculated concentration? Well, if you have fingerprints, those fingerprints are going to stop the light from going through as much, kind of like a more concentrated colored solution would do. So the presence of fingerprints will scatter or absorb the light. Since less light will reach the detector, the solution will have a higher apparent absorbance and therefore a higher reported concentration. And then finally, why can we use this method to determine the concentration for cobalt 2 chloride, but not for NaCl? Well, cobalt chloride is a red solution, while NaCl is a clear and colorless solution. So because of that, NaCl, or a colorless solution, wouldn't absorb visible light at higher concentrations. So... I would go on with the topic, top reason a cobalt chloride solution absorbs visible light because it has color in it, while a colorless solution, all of the light would pass straight through. It wouldn't depend on the concentration. All right, going to try this last one um, from 2004. Restart when you're done. So for A, there was two different ways you could do it. You could have solved it with the A equals ABC equation since they gave you the path length and molar absorptivity. You also could have just set up a proportion since the path length and molar absor absorptivity was constant throughout the reaction. So I set up a proportion. I had my concentration and the absorbance and then my new absorbance and I'm looking for X. So x was 1.2 times 10 to the negative fourth molarity. If you had done it the other way, you would have gotten the same answer. So again, that would have been a equals abc. To find concentration, you would have put the absorbance on top, and then a and b on bottom to solve for your concentration. Then we went to kinetics. They told you that it was first order. They have time. So first order, half-life, our first order equation is that. And since we are trying to find the rate constant, we just needed to plug it into one of them. So I went with the third one. So ln of my final concentration is equal to negative k, don't know. My t is 44.2 for the equation I used plus ln of the initial, which is what we saw for in A. Subtracting and then dividing by negative 44.2, I get K is equal to 0 0.031. Since it's first order, my unit should be one over time and my time is in minutes. So just like most kinetic problems, you did get one point for the answer and one point for the units in this problem. So then it says, well, how much time will it take for it to drop from 0.60 to 0.075? Well, again, we're looking for time, so we're just using that same equation. But now we're going to look for time instead of k. So I know my final concentration is the 0.075 absorbance, which is 1.5 concentration. I know what my K is. I'm looking for time and my initial concentration is still what I got in A. If I'd messed up A, I'm going to have to plug in whatever wrong answer for all of these to get credit. So again, subtracting and then dividing by negative 0.031, I get 67 minutes. So then the last one is half-life. Remember your half-life equation is on the formula chart. So that's T1 half is equal to 0.691 over K. So I just needed to plug in whatever I got in B. And so that gave me 22 minutes.